Jonah chapter 4 this morning. Now this chapter is the chapter that we titled Running Ahead of God. But Jonah chapter 4 is really the highlight of Jonah's heart in this book. The highlight of the book itself is the revival in Nineveh and the people getting saved. Obviously, that is the highlight. But ultimately, we see that throughout the entire book of Jonah, God had been dealing with a prophet. And there, there's so much to take out of the story of Jonah, ultimately because we've been seeing how God deals with his people or per sin, if you will. And ultimately, we see that what brought Jonah back to the place in which he would keep his vows that he made before the Lord were a series of circumstances and events in his life. And so ultimately, the kind of premise that we used was hearing from God. And, and Jonah was a man who in chapter 1 heard from the Lord and then disobeyed. And we see that he didn't hear from the Lord again until he was ready to turn back to the Lord. And so then we see that when the word of the Lord in chapter 3 came to Jonah a second time, Jonah honored the word of the Lord and went and preached to the people of Nineveh. And the message was a message of judgment, but the time that it would take place would be in 40 days. And so it was that type of message, repent or be judged. And the people, rather than dismissing Jonah's message, they received it. And then there was great revival that broke out in Nineveh. And here you have a group of people who we've already talked about the brutality of the Ninevites. We've already talked about how uh, in perhaps Jonah's right, they were ripe for judgment and ultimately just wait and let the Lord judge the people of Nineveh. They were wicked. They were brutal people. But it also reveals to us the contrast between man's heart and God's heart. You see, the Bible says that, you know, man plans his ways. But, but ultimately, man's plans come to ruin. And Jonah had certain perspective in his heart, and yet God was dealing with Jonah's heart this entire time. And ultimately, we see that chapter 4 will reveal... Um, really the thoughts and intents of Jonah's heart, but also it will expose his sin. And, and you know, here's the thing about this man Jonah, is that we said this already, and I think it's important to take note of, is that, you know, Jonah never stopped being a prophet. And, and that's more for God's goodness, not for our excuse to make mistakes, rebel and sin and mess up. If anything, Jonah lost quite a bit in this. And if you guys have even paid attention to the book of Jonah, you'll notice that it's one of the only books in the Bible that ends with a question and never gives us the end result as to how Jonah responded. We don't know. It's the only book of the Bible that ends this way. And this is, I believe, for a couple of reasons. One, that perhaps it reveals to us how a man's heart can be far from God, but his mind could have a knowledge of God. Two, I believe that perhaps Jonah's response was Jonah's entire letter. So two of those things can very well be the case. We don't know for sure, but this was the idea that I would perhaps look and learn because chapter four deals so much with the heart. And so ultimately we see that the greatest work has already taken place, but, but notice what we see. When God's dealing with Jonah's heart, he's showing Jonah the depth of his unappreciation for the Lord. And ultimately what happens is Jonah's selfishness overrides God's greatest revival, the greatest revival in the Bible. And Jonah, once again, makes the story about him rather than the salvation of the people of Nineveh. And ultimately what we see is how God will then reveal to us 
what Jonah's heart is like. So we know that God looks at the heart ultimately is what it boils down to, right? And um, oftentimes we hear this scripture, or excuse me, uh, we hear this phrase, and uh, the phrase is this, well, God knows my heart. And you know, listen, guys, the Bible speaks against that statement. That's selfishness and pride. The Bible says very clearly that the heart is deceitfully. The, the Bible is revealing to you that that should never be a statement that you utter or rely on because the Bible says in Jeremiah chapter 17 that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? And ultimately, when you're saying, well, God knows my heart, you're determining that according to your heart, you know you did right before the Lord. You don't know your heart. And ultimately, God does know your heart, and he's not pleased with it, the Bible says. That's why God promises you a new heart. And let me tell you something, you're not complete until we see Christ face to face. You're in this process of sanctification. You can't go and, because imagine if we were able to do that, guess what we can do? If we wrong one another... If we, if, we, if we do things that tread upon perhaps us maybe making a mishap or a misstep, we can dismiss it with, well, God knows my heart. It's kind of like that same attitude when people say, well, only God can judge me. You're saying the same thing. And ultimately, this is kind of the idea in which Jonah will be dealt with. Remember what the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 16 it teaches us very clearly in verses 1 through 7. We know the story, but remember what the Bible says, that God looks at the heart. God looks at the heart. And, and so much so, let me explain something to you. God's the one that does the heart work, not you and I. So ultimately, at the end of the day, if in fact your statement is, well, God knows my heart. In other words, you're saying that, hey, I know I did right. Well, God knows my heart. Then you're saying that what you have done was done by the hand of the Lord. Because the Bible says it's God who works in you. What is he working on? Your heart. It's God who works in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And so the point I want to get across in, in this, because this is going to come up, it's when one trusts in his heart and one looks to his heart and one uses the excuse of, well, I know in my heart I did right. The better translation would be, according to my emotion, I made this decision. And this is where the Lord deals with Jonah. You can be a prophet and be an emotional one. Bad news. You see, ultimately, what brought victory in Jonah's life was the day that Jonah said, I will pay the vow I made to you. The vow I vowed to you. This is where God did a work in Jonah's life. It wasn't about Jonah anymore. It was about the vow that he had made to God, the commitment. And this is where the word of the Lord then came back to Jonah. And ultimately, it was because at that particular point and statement, it was about God and not about Jonah anymore. You see, so then we see that after this great revival takes place, you would think that at the end of the chapter, we would hear Jonah say, praise the Lord. I'm so, I'm so thankful that, man, I could have made a horrible decision and a horrible mistake, and I could have been destroyed in the fish. But because of God's grace... He brought me out, gave me a second chance to do this. And, and ultimately, not everybody has the same experience as Jonah. Not everybody gets a second chance. But Jonah did. And revival broke out. And then, in chapter 4, the Bible says in verse 1, it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. What Displeased Jonah. Well, the Bible clearly teaches in chapter 3 and verses 7 that the people responded with repentance. 
The Bible says in verses 6, 7, 8, and 9 that not only the people, but the king of Nineveh responded in an outward expression of mourning with sackcloth and ashes, and it didn't even stop there. They said, even every beast and every man be covered. In other words, everything that we are here, everybody responded to the message. And ultimately we see that this great revival was truly what God desired to do among the people of Nineveh. Now it probably wasn't Jonah's first idea or desire for the Ninevites. But ultimately it's not about what Jonah wants. It's about what God desires to do. And so now the Bible says rather than be happy and overjoyed... It says that it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Notice something, guys, that I think we need to be very uh, uh, careful here as we look at verse 1 because we do not want to in any way dismiss the strong Hebrew language that's being used in verse 1. When it says that Jonah was exceedingly displeased, that he became exceedingly angry, it literally means that Jonah was Clearly upset. The word angry, karar in the Hebrew, means to glow, to blaze up. Notice this, to be hot. This is how upset Jonah was. He was angry. You ever been so upset that, you know, you get a, like a heat flash, man? You get so angry, you're, you're just, you're, your insides turn and you're, you know, and we use the phrase, my blood boiled, Right? But because that's the best way to describe how angry you were. And ultimately, imagine that, but perhaps ten times more with Jonah. But here's what makes it ten times more. He's angry with God. He's angry with God. Ultimately, God will reveal to Jonah, this is what you're not happy with. And so what we see here. In this chapter, as I said before, that this chapter reveals the thought and intents of Jonah's heart. But it also exposes his sin. Being that God does look at the heart, God has a way of revealing to you and I what is really in our heart. And remember, as it's been said, and it will always be said, that the heart of every problem is the heart itself. The heart of every problem is the heart itself. And so the Bible says, rather than rejoice, Jonah was upset. He was mad. And notice what Jonah does. In his anger, he prays. Now that's not a good thing. Because here Jonah is... Speaking to God, it's what he's doing. He's not praying in the way that you and I would think that prayer is. Oh, there he is getting a hold of the Lord. No, Jonah's prayer is a questioning of God. Jonah's prayer, his his ability to speak to the Lord, his second prayer is not a good prayer. And notice his prayer is, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still In my country. Notice what he's saying here in regards to the Lord. In Jonah chapter 1 and verse 3, this was his issue that God was gracious. His issue was God's graciousness and forgiveness. He says here, this is what I said when I was in my country. Therefore, I fled previously to Tarsus, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah knew the attributes of God. In other words, what Jonah is complaining about is he's saying, Lord, what I'm upset about is I knew that you would forgive them. They don't deserve your forgiveness. They deserve your judgment and your destruction. And ultimately, if you see here what Jonah is doing, is he's saying, this is what they deserve. Not grace and mercy, but being destroyed. Jonah, in his prayer, in his own words, reveals why he was angry. He was mad because of God's attributes. Here's another thing we need to consider. 
Jonah had good theology. He understood God's attributes. He had good theology, but it stayed in his head, not in his heart. There are so many Christians, leaders. I've seen it in this church. I've seen it in other churches. I've seen it in the lives of many Christians. They understand the attributes of God. They know how to quote the verses. And, and, and they understand some theology, but it's never taken residence in their heart. Never. And there's a twofold thing with that. The Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I believe it's right around verse 1, where it says that knowledge puffs up. So even the Bible is very clear that it's one thing to understand the attributes of God. That's fine, but that doesn't make you any more of a Christian than anybody else. I mean, Satan knows the attributes of God better than any person alive. But it's when the attributes of God, the theology of God, the grace and mercy and goodness and forgiveness of God transfers from your mind to your heart that it becomes that very thing that you live out because your life becomes a vessel in which the attributes and characteristics of God can be displayed for all the world to see in and through your life. That is your initial calling and ministry, that he gets the glory, not you. And ultimately what you see here with Jonah in his response is that Jonah is saying, I understand who you are. As a matter of fact, in the book of the Exodus chapter 34 and verse 6, and these are the very start of Israel's understanding of God, you'll see in Exodus 34, 6 that the Bible says that God is gracious and he's merciful. In Numbers chapter 14 and verse 18, the Bible says that God is gracious and He's long-suffering and He's merciful. In Psalm 86, in verse 15, the Bible says that God is gracious, He's merciful to all. Not just Israel, to all. In Psalm 103, in verse 8, once again, God's graciousness, His goodness, the Bible says. Psalm 145, in verses 8 through 9, reveals to us the goodness of God. And the point that we're trying to make is that the Bible speaks very clearly of God's omnibenevolence, that God is always good. And so then we see in passages like Joel chapter 2 and verse 13, once again, we are reminded of God's goodness and faithfulness. So it wasn't like Jonah didn't know the goodness of the Lord. No, he was very well acquainted with the attributes of God. The problem was, is that most likely it was head knowledge, never taken residence in the heart. You see, guys, here's how you know when someone, in a sense, is being led by their emotions. When they make every way to explain their heart, their thoughts, their motives, and their intents. You see, you should never have to do that if you're a child of God. Ultimately, God's word reveals what we really are. And thus, we obey God's word in spite of what it is that surrounds us, in spite of what we think we need. God's word will tell you what you need more than what your own heart will tell you. And this is why the Bible says that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who could know it? Oftentimes, here, as Jonah is saying, he's very well acquainted with God's attributes. But Jonah never lived them out. It's kind of like that phrase that we say of people who know God. In one instance, we say, listen, it's estimated that the brain is 18 inches from the heart. And your knowledge of God, well, that's not what saves you. It's when that knowledge takes residence in your heart and you become born again. You see, so there are many who will miss heaven by 18 inches because it has to go from a heart knowledge, or excuse me, from a knowledge in your mind to a heart knowledge. And what we find in this is that ultimately Jonah was missing a big thing here. He could have 
enjoyed the blessings that followed with the people of Nineveh, rather than rejoice, he was displeased. And sometimes some would think that, well, yeah, his displeasure is evident, but sometimes our displeasure is not evident in the way that Jonah is expressing it. Sometimes our displeasure is evident in our own decisions and actions. We're not pleased the direction that God's taking us in our life. And it will ultimately be revealed as to these steps and directions that we take, whether they're of the Lord or they're not of the Lord. Here, Jonah initially thought to himself that he was taking the right steps and fleeing from the Lord, but ultimately the Lord showed him these were wrong steps. And then look at what happens here. And some, and some would think that, that, you know, keep in mind, guys, that Jonah departing from the Lord in the way that he did in chapter 1, everybody would, right away, when we say running from God, I, I want you guys to kind of just bring that down to the place of, that was really between God and Jonah. It wasn't evident to the people around that Jonah was running from the Lord. But God knew that he was, and so did Jonah. And so to everybody else, perhaps they were patting Jonah on the back, saying, hey, well, we hope you have a blessed trip. It's kind of the picture I'm trying to give you. Yes, okay, I will. The farewell, if you will. But ultimately, man doesn't know. God knows. And so we see that now the Lord is in this prayer revealing to Jonah the thoughts and motives of his heart. Then it says, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. So Jonah's second prayer is, Kill me. He'd rather die than live, and he's angry because his will did not prevail. He first prayed in chapter 2, in verses 1 through 9, Save me. In chapter 4, his second prayer is, God, remove me, take me out. And ultimately, this was a result of what was in Jonah's heart. Not because Jonah messed up or anything like this. This was just the thought that he had. He was so displeased with the people of Nineveh. And sometimes, guys, we don't realize that there are still things that God is working out in our lives, right? And then we wonder, where did this come from? I thought I dealt with it already. It's kind of a picture here with Jonah. In chapter 3, you would think that he was done with whatever the issue was. And now that revival has taken place and the ministry's gone well, Jonah now reverts back to this mindset. And he's like, I just can't get away from hating these people. And so what does the Lord do? Does the Lord write Jonah off? And does the Lord dismiss Jonah? No, the Lord once again begins to work with Jonah, even in the midst of his wickedness and his rebellion again. And the Lord desires to reveal to Jonah the depth of his sin that he's committing as he carries his hate with the people of Nineveh. So then the Lord now responds to Jonah and begins to speak to Jonah. Jonah's prayer was, See, Lord, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to save them. Then the Lord says, is it right for you to be angry? God now asks Jonah a question. Sometimes God asks us questions for the purpose to cause us to realize what is really taking place. If you think about it here, Jonah wasn't the first person that says, you know, I just wish I was dead. He actually joined the ranks of a couple of men. Some men, like Job, in Job chapter 6, in verses 8 through 9, said, you know, it's probably better for me just to be dead. Moses also uttered the very same words in Numbers chapter 11, in verses 10 through 15. And we know the story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, in verse 4. And I think all of us can relate to this type of emotion, that sometimes we just feel, you know what, it's just better for me to be done with, but that's not the Lord God. That's your heart deceiving you. And so ultimately what it was for Jonah was that it was better for him to die than to live. 
Talk about not being thankful for God's great work. So God asks a question. And the question is, Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? Is it really right for you to be angry? This is a very important question. We are to do the will of God from the heart. Listen, what does it mean to do the will of God from the heart? Some people think it means to be a good Christian, to be faithful. Uh, you're wrong. That's not what it is at all whatsoever. Those are works. That's not doing the will of God from your heart. Doing the will of God from your heart is dying to yourself. Dying to yourself. There's no greater picture than a person who's died to themselves like that of Jesus and his disciples. If Jesus and the disciples and the church is not the picture of what dying to oneself is in our own heart, then we've missed it. And oftentimes we offer our own ideology, our own philosophy as to, well, you know, I know. Well, technically you don't know. When God reveals things to us, then we have some knowledge. And this is what the Lord is doing with Jonah. Jonah, you might have went to Nineveh and there might have been a great revival, but you're getting a little bit ahead of me now. You see, Jonah, now you feel it's time for you to do something else because Jonah is actually doing something else. He's no longer doing God's will like he was in chapter 3. Jonah now has just stepped outside of God's will and he's going to do something else. The first thing he did was he prayed and ultimately, in his mind, he's justified by his prayer. The second thing Jonah does is he also, in his prayer, expressed to God that he knows what's going on. He says, I know that you would have been gracious and merciful. And he also expresses, I, I, I know how this works, God. I know that you're gracious. I know that you're merciful. Wrong attitude to have. If you're not paying attention, please do so now. What we see is that Jonah has become very selfish and self-centered. And look at what else. So the Lord asks him a question. And the Lord asks questions throughout the Bible. And when God asks a question, be prepared to answer. The first question that God ever asked was, where are you in Genesis chapter 3? Where are you? And I think that question should be asked on more than one occasion. Where are you? Where are you as it pertains to what we've discussed? You see, when Adam and Eve fell into sin, well, we know that they were hiding after sin had revealed to them that they were what? Naked. And then the Bible says that the Lord was there in the garden, in the cool of the day, right? And, and Adam was hiding. And it wasn't that God couldn't find him. God knew where Adam was. But God wanted to ask Adam, do you understand where you are? And this is why he asked Adam this question, where are you? Now we know that Adam's response was, well, I'm over here hiding. Why? Because I'm naked. Well, who told you you were naked? But ultimately what God was trying to teach Adam was, listen, you are no longer where you were prior to the fall. And now that sin has become the very thing that now has entered your life, sin will reveal to you where you really are. Pretty interesting, right? So, the Lord asks Jonah, is it right for you to be angry? God also asked another question in Genesis chapter 4 to a man by the name of Cain. He said, where is your brother? Once again, God asking man a question, not so much questioning man, but in a sense, he is questioning him. 
What do you think God is questioning when he's talking to Adam and he's talking to Cain? What do you think God's questioning? God is questioning the motives of their heart. And didn't the Lord tell Cain this? Hey, you better watch out. He says, sin lies at the door of your heart. And then it was not too long after that that Cain killed his brother Abel. And after he committed the sin, just like his dad, after he committed the sin, then the Lord asks the question, where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? You see, when you look at this, God asks us these questions to reveal to us the motives and intents of our heart. So there are two ways that God answers questions, right? One, we know according to Scripture. There are Scriptures that ask us a question. Have you ever just read through the Bible or perhaps even a verse that you've read and it just hits you really hard and then you take inventory of your heart and you say, where, where am I with this? That's one way God speaks to us, through His Word. So He asks us questions. Another way that God speaks to us and asks us questions is through His Word, ultimately, but also through brothers and sisters, elders in the church. And sometimes God will bring a question out through those that He puts in our lives. And ultimately what we see here is that the Lord then asks another question, and he says, what have you done? What have you done? We also see in Isaiah chapter 6, the Lord asks another question. Who shall I send and who will go for us? We see that that was the commissioning of the prophet Isaiah. The Isaiah says, there, here I am, Lord, send me. But once again, the Lord, not because the Lord doesn't know. Listen, guys, God's questions to you and me are to reveal to us the thought and motives of our heart. Because what's in your heart is going to come out. And it's funny how sometimes people feel like they can't be questioned. <laughs> when the Bible is full of a lot of questions. I mean, ultimately, this is what draws out in us what needs to be revealed. And so God asking Jonah this question is not far-fetched in the Bible. It's not anything that, that we would look at and say, well, this is absurd, because it's not. As a matter of fact, Jesus in the New Testament said in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 32, he says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? He's asking a question. Jesus also asked the question to Judas Iscariot in Luke chapter 22 and verse 48. He says, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? In Acts chapter 9, Jesus also asks Saul of Tarsus a question. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? So God asked Jonah a question here in verse 4. So he could see why he was really angry. Not so that God can see, so that Jonah can see why he was really angry. And then it says here, after the Lord asked this question, so Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. Notice, he didn't even go that far out. He, he went outside, he was in the city when he got angry. The Bible is saying he goes outside the city. The revival has just taken place. He goes outside the city and notice there he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. Interesting. You should underline that. What would become of the city? So as Jonah prayed twice, the prayer of repentance came really from a broken heart in the belly of the fish. It came from a broken heart. His second prayer came from an angry heart. He prayed his best prayer in the worst place. That was in the belly of the fish. And he prayed his worst prayer in the best place. And that is where Nineveh was saved and God was working. His best prayer in the worst place, the belly of the fish, 
and his worst prayer in the city of Nineveh where God did his greatest work. Interesting. So you see here that God was working in and through Jonah's life. And, and, and notice what verse 5 reveals to us. Jonah is really double-minded. One minute he's preaching God's word and the next he's disobeying it. The Bible says in James chapter 1 and verse 8 that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. This is a clear picture of Jonah here, man. One minute he knows what he wants, the next minute he doesn't know what he wants, and, and one minute he wants to do God's will, the next minute he wants to do his own thing, his own will. In no way in Jonah's will was God getting the glory at all whatsoever. None. Jonah could have lived his days out. Listen to this, guys. Jonah could have lived his days out as just a prophet of God, went down in the history books of the Scriptures as the prophet that spoke in 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25, ultimately just kind of doing whatever, never went to Nineveh. God would have raised up another prophet to do it. And in Jonah's mind, well, this is it. Hey, you know what? I don't know what. I didn't backslide. I didn't leave the Lord. Pride and selfishness. Your life is no longer your own. But the Lord wanted to teach Jonah something greater than that. And notice what we see here. We see that once again, Jonah resorts to the work of his own hands. In other words, what is he saying? He's, listen to this. God's greatest victory took place in Nineveh, right? Jonah's now disagreeing with this great work. And you guys might think that to disagree with God's word has to be this outright, blatant disagreeing and saying, I'm not happy about that. No, in, in any way, the scriptures are not saying that it technically doesn't have to be that. As a matter of fact, you just not doing God's will is the same heart that Jonah has. Jonah's just revealing to us how God revealed to him what was really in his heart. And so what we see here is that he goes outside the city and we see that Jonah resorts now once again to the work of his own hands. Just like he did when he went on the ship to Tarsus. Every door opened for him. Remember what I said, guys. Listen, not every door that opens is God opening. The biggest mistake, you know, just the other day, yesterday, as a matter of fact, I was driving to the beach, and one of the things, just in the middle of driving, I turned to my wife and I says, this, this whole talk of seasons... is one of the greatest distractions in the Christian faith. And I says, you know, when people say, well, I'm in this season right now, that that's not what the Bible teaches. And now the season justifies their actions and what they're doing. When ultimately, when did the apostles ever use that language? When did the leaders of the early church, those who we are to mimic, when did Jesus ever say, I'm just in this season of my life right now? That is not biblical Christianity. And the point that's being made is your life is either bought at a price and completely hidden in Christ as the scriptures say. When it says hidden in Christ, what does that mean? It's no longer you that's visible, but Jesus. When it's you that's visible, it's no longer Jesus, it's you. So the season is not coming from what the scriptures teach. The season is coming from your own rebellion. And so my wife looked at me and she says, well, what point are you trying to make? I says, well, if you buy into this restaurant theology, it's good for a season, then it's not. Then you're not in the will of God. Because in God's will, one is never, ever dissatisfied. It's only outside of his will that all of a sudden there are seasons now. To justify your disobedience and to justify all these things that you got going on. Let me tell you something. I have yet to meet someone that is totally committed to the will of God ever be dissatisfied. Even when things are tough, there's joy. That is the will of God. So this season theology, 
Bad theology. Bad theology. You see, ultimately, the will of God is to be lived out so that he gets the glory. And if God is going to use you as a vessel to get his glory in whatever circumstance or situation that you face in your life, it's not a season, it's God's will. Live for him. Why? Because he pays high dividends for obedience even in difficult times. God never said his will was easy. All he said was to obey it. So you leave the how great, how tough it is to the Lord. And listen, that, that, that deep-seated teaching of seasons, it's become kind of common in the church now. Now there's excuses for people in their disobedience and nobody's being held accountable. Because if it is a season that you're in, then there's no accountability. Why? Because it's the season you're in. But if it's not season and it's a matter of disobedience, now there's accountability. So what does it draw you to do? I know people that have been in a season for years. It's like, really? Wow. Yeah, I've been in this season for seven years now. You see, this is the problem with the church. I remember reading a book by one of my favorite authors, Warren Wiersbe, but I disagreed quite a bit with his book. And the book is called Spiritual Burnout. I disagree with that. I disagree with a Christian getting burned out. Man gets burned out. But a child of God doesn't. It's the least we can do. And oh, well, you know, it's talking about taking all this on and this. Well, if it's about works to you, then yeah, it's a matter of doing too much. But if it's the least you can do. And don't get me wrong, don't mistake physical frailties and weaknesses with spiritual things. Spiritually, you should never be burned out. It's a privilege. We, we, we get to do this, not have to do this. Right? So it's not about being burned out or a season, if you will. It's about resting in what God has promised in His Word. You're either going to rest in it or you're going to resist it. Wow, that's a good word. Rest or resist your choice. I'd rather rest in it because resisting it, well, guess what? Then I get in this funky mode of, you know what? It's just the season I'm in right now. One thing after that conversation with my wife, I thought to myself, how hard is this type of verbiage going to take to get out of our vocabulary? Now I'll be reminded every time somebody says season. Mm. And then I will be reminded of when it comes out of my mouth. See, oh, something has happened. <laughs> you see, the problem, guys, is that we look at God's will and we think that we can pick and choose what we want and it's His will, not ours. So the work of His own hands. Can I tell you that a season is the work of your own hands? Wow. Wow. Think about this now. So somebody in today's evangelical Christianity, guess what they would say? They would look at the story of Jonah and they would say, well, you see, in chapter one, he was in this season of, no, listen, he was either obeying or disobeying. And every time he disobeyed, God got his attention. Why? Because he's gracious. I gave you a lot of passages. He's merciful. He's good. He's loving. He's long suffering. That's why. Once again, Jonah resorts to the work of his own hands. And what does he do? He makes himself a shelter. And he sat under it in its shade till he might see what would become of the city. Well, guess what he was waiting for? That God would judge it. He's like, I'm going to sit outside and I'm going to hope that their salvation doesn't take. Because the moment they mess up, poof, they're gone. 
So now that salvation has come to Nineveh, Jonah is waiting for God's judgment to come a hundred plus years before his judgment would come. Jonah's getting ahead of God. Getting ahead of God doesn't mean you're in his will. It means now you're outside of it once again. And notice what he does. He makes himself a shelter. Guys, listen, Jonah makes himself comfortable outside of God's will. You know, we make ourselves comfortable outside of God's will sometimes. It must be the Lord. He's opened up this door. How do you know that God's opened up a door just because everything's easy? Wrong. God opens up a door through difficulty. It's never easy. If that was the case, man, every good thing that happened in my life would be that was the Lord. The devil knows how to counterfeit that which is good and sometimes take us in a whole different direction. And boy, do we spiritualize it because all these good things take place. We need to be very careful. Not every good idea is a God idea. And all that glitters isn't gold. And Jonah feels that now that he's prepared himself a little shade and he's sitting outside of the city and he's, and he's looking upon it and, and there he is comfortable, the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah. Listen, not only did it come up over Jonah, it came over his little shade, his little, his little tiny you know, comfort zone he made. And look at what happens here. This, this plant is a castor oil plant, most likely. A plant that grows rapidly in the desert, very big, and it spreads out. It's a plant, but it spreads out huge bush, and it covers. Its leaves are big, and notice, this is really the picture here, but God prepared it, meaning what? That we know if God prepared it, it's going to grow unusually, unusual growth, and then it will grow and it will cover. So this is God's doing. It doesn't mean that these plants grow in one day. God caused it to grow this way. And it, and it came over Jonah that it might shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Now Jonah's happy. The Bible says in verse 1 of chapter 4 that he was angry. Now he's happy. Can, do, do you see maybe perhaps a bit of... Being bipolar, I don't know. <laughs> but we see that Jonah is, in one moment, angry with God. Now he's happy. Wow. Happy for his own comfort, but not happy for God's work. Happy for his own comfort. See, i got to take care of myself, Jonah's saying. Selfish, self-centered, Happy only when he has comfort. Sometimes people want to be comforted in the will of God. God's will is good, trust me, but in his will, God stretches us because he's shaping and he's molding us. I mean, what good is God to be the anvil in our life if he can't chip away the things that he's not pleased with? And this is what God does for us. He, he works in our life in this way. And so don't resist. Even when you don't understand why God is, is bringing you to a place to do, it's a part of his will. It's his purpose. It's his plan. And you know, sometimes we learn so much about the Lord, right? In that. Especially doing things that we never thought we would be doing. Like Jonah probably never thought that he would be going to Nineveh and preaching the gospel. But as the morning dawned, the next day God prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant that it withered. You see how God works. It's not here that the Lord is playing this game with Jonah. No, God is saying, okay, Jonah, this is what you look like. This is what you are. And God, once again, goes back to speaking to Jonah through what? Circumstances. Jonah got away from that when he turned to the Lord in the belly of the fish, right? And the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Notice the moment that Jonah stepped outside of the city, 
and prepared his own little hut, the work of his own hand, once again, God started speaking to Jonah through circumstances. Guys, may I reiterate and re-emphasize, please, it's better to hear from the Lord in his word rather than him to speak to us through circumstances. I'd rather listen to God in his word. And so the Bible says that the Lord then prepared a worm and it so damaged the plant. Think about that. It damaged the plant that it withered. Circle that just for a moment. That it dam the worm damaged the plant and it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement west, east, excuse me, wind. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint then he wished death for himself and said, it is better for me to die than to live. Well, God here describes Jonah's anger. That Jonah's anger here had reached a point of him being irrational. You're going to start to see now Jonah's response after the Lord now deals with him. So God prepares this worm to eat this plant that God had. Listen, this type of plant, this castor oil plant, if you even damage the vine a little bit, it ruins the whole plant. So it didn't take much for this worm to destroy this plant. Just a little bit of damage to the stock will ruin the whole thing. And so that's what the worm did. And so ultimately the worm was used to ruin his comfort outside of God's will. And once the worm revealed to Jonah that there's no comfort outside of God's will, it also revealed to him what would be awaiting him outside of God's will. This vehement east wind that brought about this scorching feeling upon Jonah, he's saying, listen, you need to be aware and outside of the will of God is judgment. So Jonah here, his lessons are one, jot it down, providence and patience. The providence of God going before him, but also patience. I meet a lot of impatient Christians. And I can be impatient myself at times. But let me tell you something. He learned to be patient. He learned. What he also learned was forgiveness and pardon. Forgiveness and pardon. The third thing we see that Jonah learned was he learned the power of God. The power of God. And the fourth thing that Jonah learned was he learned pity and compassion. Now, God did all this to teach Jonah quite a bit in his own personal life, but what we see is that now God is revealing to Jonah how his anger has made him this irrational, uh, irrational person. What we see here clearly is that the antidote for Jonah is found clearly in his expression. That Jonah is double-minded. That Jonah is wavering back and forth. It says, then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? Remember that God asked him that again. Listen in verse 4. The Lord says, is it right for you to be angry? What was he angry about? Well, we know that he said in verse 2, he was angry because God was merciful and he was gracious and he was slow to anger and he was abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. This is why he was mad. He knew that God would forgive. And then the Lord asks him again, you're mad now again because the plant is gone? Is that what you're mad about? And he said, is it right for me to be angry even to death? Notice this. Once again, it's believed that here Jonah is breaking his vow again to the Lord. The Bible is very clear in Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2 that 
vows made to the Lord. Listen, guys, here, here's, here's what I always tell people, especially people that are getting into ministry. And some people have gotten discouraged behind this. They have come to the church and really excited and gun ho about everything, you know, and I want to do this and I want to serve here. And, and a lot of times I tell them, relax. Wait. Just relax. The second you start saying, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, that's a vow. And the moment you say, I'm going to do this, you need to finish it. Because now you're breaking your vow. And guess what? This is why, let, let me read to you what the Bible says about vows, okay? Just so we can have a better understanding why we're not to make vows. In the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 5, the Bible says, Walk prudently when you go to the house of God, and draw near to hear rather than to give the sacrifice of fools. For they do not know that they do evil. Do not be rash with your mouth, and let not your heart utter anything hastily before God. For God is in heaven and you are on earth, therefore let your words be few. For a dream comes through much activity, and a fool's voice is known by his many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you have vowed, better not to vow than to vow and not pay. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Wow. Sometimes we say things like, well, you know, I'll do this for the Lord. And then the messenger of God comes to you and says, hey, I thought you said you were going to do this. Well, no, it's, it's, it's a different season I'm in. <laughs> Good one, boy. Good one. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, we know because we've experienced, me and the administrator here have experienced something that most of the leaders we discuss in the church. Oh, well, you know, it, I didn't really mean it. Or things are different now. The warning is very clear. You make a vow to the Lord you keep it. And I think that when a person keeps all the vows that he's made to the Lord, ultimately what happens is there's always joy and happiness in doing the will of God. Now listen, that doesn't mean, listen guys, that does not mean that you cannot have joy and happiness outside of God's will. Because the Bible says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his own soul? Listen, you can, and you might think you're still in the will of God, but let me tell you something, you're not. Jonah had happiness outside of God's will. But you want to know what? That happiness is always short-lived. And didn't Jonah pay a big sacrifice every time he stepped outside of it? then go ahead and pay it because your vow requires it. So it's better to keep the vows that you make. Listen, in Numbers chapter 30 and verse 2, it's very clear that this is what God requires of us. And so look at what else we see here. So he says, can you really be angry about the plant? And he said, is it right for me to be angry? even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh? Listen, he says to Jonah, listen, Jonah, you have more pity on something that you yourself did not have control over. How is it that you have the right to invite your emotions and your feelings into something that has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with me. And if you were truly obedient, you would be okay with it, whether you agreed with it or not, because it's not about you. 
and it never can be. It's about me. And the child of God surrenders his life to the Lord and is okay with everything that the Lord requires of him. What is he telling Jonah? You're not a surrendered child. You have no right to be angry with Nineveh. You didn't create the Ninevites. I did. You have no right to be angry with the plant. I created it and I destroyed it. How is it that you can insert your emotions? Who are you, Jonah? You see, when it becomes about you, boy, I'll tell you, God knows how to deal with us. May God humble us when it, come, when it becomes about me and you. May God humble us when we take what we vowed to the Lord, even the smallest vow. Let me tell you something. God doesn't overlook. The Bible says we are snared by the words of our mouth. The vow that we made is a vow that we're to keep. He says, Jonah, he says, you have no right to be upset. And should I not pity Nineveh? That great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand and much livestock. Boom, the end of the book. No amen. No Jonah repented. No Jonah saying sorry. You know what the Lord is saying? Jonah, do you even understand? Obviously he didn't. When he says there are 120,000 that can't discern between their right hand and their left hand, well, who is he talking about? Most likely he's speaking about children. If there are 120,000 children in Nineveh, then that gives us the perfect example of there being 600,000 people. Ultimately, we see here what the Lord is saying. You mean to tell me, Jonah, that it would have been right for me to destroy these children who have not even come to the age of accountability? They don't know that they're being raised in wrong. They don't know that they're doing... In other words, what he's saying is, my desire is to show mercy upon them, and ultimately you're saying don't because you don't like them. Well, you didn't create them, and you didn't have a desire to say, I do, I'm God. And Jonah, what you need to do is surrender and submit rather than resist. And so Jonah didn't really know God as well as he thought he did. He didn't really know God as well as he thought he did. You know, there are a lot of people that really think they know God. They get it in, man. It's like, I know, I know, I know him. Well, what we see here is that God had a heart for the city of Nineveh that Jonah didn't. There are three mistakes that Jonah made. These are three mistakes that people make when they're not happy, or when they're angry, or when they're in their season. The first mistake is, Jonah quit. That's the first thing you do is you quit. You quit. The second thing that Jonah did is Jonah separated himself from his close proximity with God. He separated himself from others. Second thing you do, you go into isolation. You separate yourself. You find something else to do. And the third thing that Jonah does here is that Jonah now became a spectator. Looking at Nineveh from the outside, looking in. Three mistakes that he made. We should never be spectators. Spectators <laughs> become spectacles. Keep in mind that you don't want to become a spectacle. You don't want to be a spectator. You want to be involved in what God's called you to do. To further and advance his kingdom so that we can live a life that brings honor and glory to the Lord. And Jonah resisted here everything that God did good for Nineveh. Pretty much chapter 4, Jonah's heart said this. I disagree with your good, God. Do you guys think that's pretty bold? I do. Some people have taken the story of Jonah... And have said that the story of Jonah is likened to the story of the prodigal son. That chapters 1, 2, 
and 3 are a clear picture of the prodigal son. But chapter 4 is the picture of the elder son who is not happy and pleased with the forgiveness that the father showed the prodigal son. In other words, you can say that if Jonah lived in the times of Christ, Jonah probably would have most likely been one of the Pharisees that rejected Jesus. What you find is that the scriptures teach us not to be pharisaical, but they teach us to be humble. There's nothing wrong with having a devoted, committed, disciplined Christian life, but when your disciplines become the outlines for how others are to live, then you become a Pharisee. And so we see here that ultimately it ends with the question. And the question was, should I not pity Nineveh, Jonah? That great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock. Jonah never answered the question. The Lord taught Jonah that he had really no right to be upset. Sometimes we get upset, right? We really have no right to be upset. If we are a child of God, listen. Listen. He's in control of everything. Amen. And you know, when you look at this here, you'll find that in, in, the, in the chapter here that we said that Jonah was very grateful for the plant. And then God brought about this worm to destroy the comfort of Jonah's sin. And then the worm also stood in between this vehement east wind that brought about this great trial and heat to the point in which Jonah grew faint. And the end result was, I just wish I would die. The worm stands between man's comfort and the reality of his comfort. So it's an interesting picture. This worm kind of plays the role in this picture here. We know that in the Hebrew, the word for worm is the Hebrew word tolaf. And you might wonder, what do you mean by the word tolaf? Well, it's interesting because in the book of the prophet Isaiah, in chapter 1 and verse 18, the Bible says, though your sins may be red as scarlet, I'll make them white as snow. Though they may be red as crimson, I will make them white as wool. And what's interesting about this very promise that Isaiah makes, the promise is that their sins can be made white as snow and white as wool. But what I love about this verse is that ultimately, the verse starts with a word to the prophet saying, Come, let us reason together. God wanting to reason with man. God reasoning with Jonah. And God said this very clearly. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. What's interesting is it's two different English words, but they have the same meaning. Scarlet and crimson mean the same thing, red. In the Hebrew, it's two different words. Scarlet is shani, which means crimson. And crimson is not shani, it's tolaf. Tolaf, crimson, means worm. Interesting. The only other time we see the word worm used in a way that would draw attention to us is in Psalm chapter 22 which is the whole picture of Jesus going to the cross, written a thousand years before crucifixion was even practiced. David, the psalmist, wrote Psalm 22 prophetically, and it pointed to the crucifixion of Jesus. That's why Jesus quoted Psalm 22 in verse 1 when he was on the cross. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When a rabbi would quote the first verse 
It was the job of the disciples to read the rest of the chapter. When Jesus quoted, the rabbi Jesus quoted the first verse of Psalm 22, the disciples can go to that very psalm and realize the rest of the psalm depicts their Savior on the cross. And in verse 22, in chapter 22, in verse 6, David said, I am but a worm, a reproach to all men. The word worm is the Hebrew word tolaf, which also means crimson. Which also means that it was the worm that separated man's comfort and gave the realization to man's judgment. Well, who is this worm? Obviously, the scriptures lay it out very clearly to us that it's not just any type of worm because the tolaf is this worm that goes up onto a tree and prior to giving birth, it fastens itself to this tree. And then it gives birth and its offspring eat of its flesh to survive. And as this tolaf gives birth to its offspring on the tree, then as it dies after giving birth, because that's exactly what it does, it leaves this pigmentation on the tree that the people go and gather off because that's what they use to make the crimson color dye. The tolaf has to die first in order for them to get their crimson color from it. But if it's not collected, by the third day, the tolaf turns completely white and flakes off. You see, the Bible says that Jesus fastened himself to a tree, the cross. And when Jesus gave his life, the Bible says that the soldiers pierced his side to show that he was dead rather than crushing his legs to fulfill the prophecy of Psalm 22, that as Jesus' side was pierced, water and blood flowed the elements of birth. The church was birthed when the tolaf gave life to it. Jesus was crucified so the church can come forth. And just as Eve was prepared out of the side of Adam, so was the bride of Christ, the church, prepared out of his side as he bled for us. Both Adam and Jesus' sides were pierced. And that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians, what the first Adam failed to do, the last Adam came to fulfill, and that was Jesus. Jesus is the tolaf that said, Jonah, your comfort is meaningless, but what awaits you is judgment. Turn to the Lord and rest in him. Ultimately, we always find comfort in who Jesus is.